grateful we can be anywhere. <laughs> you know, that's a lot for which to be grateful, isn't it? <clears throat> Let me get my Bible open to the place where we're going to be tonight. Uh, start off with 73. Psalm 73, if you want to be opening your Bibles to that point. Right, Psalm 73. Okay, maybe I've got it all laid out here where, where I can keep it in mind. And I'm going to focus your attention on these boxes in just a minute too. The either or. Either or. You've got a handout that Beth's been passing around. Hopefully you'll have that. Now the set, uh, back side of that handout we'll be using uh, at, a, uh, in, at a later point, so hang on to it. Hope you'll hang on to, to all of these, at least till we're finished. But uh, that pilgrimage page will be not tonight, but a, the next week that we'll get to that again. So hang on to the pilgrimage page. I'm thankful you're here. And let's bow together as we begin our time of study. Heavenly Father, we cannot thank you enough for life itself. With the opportunity we have to study your word. And we know that you promised that if we had had your word in our heart, we wouldn't sin against you. That your word is to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. May that also be true as we follow you. Lord, give us understanding of your word and application for our daily lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been looking at the character of God as seen in the Psalms as we've gone through uh, this. Our, our first uh, study was concerning the character of God through the sending of His Son. And we looked at Psalm 22, 23, and 24. We were looking at the fact that God's Son, of course, brought our salvation into the world. And chapter 22 looks back to uh, much of that. You can see the cross of Jesus expressed in that. And uh, it, it's that which he did for us on the cross that provided for our salvation. Psalm 23 looks at the present of our salvation experience uh, in, in that he saves us from the, the power of, uh, first from the penalty of sin, then from the power of sin. And then chapter, or Psalm 24, uh, we looked at the future relationship we have in, in, through our salvation and he, where he will save us from the very presence of sin. We'll not even uh, have temptation there on the other side in heaven. And then in the second section, we looked at experiencing God's compassion and forgiveness. And particularly at Psalm 32 and 51, uh, the, uh, the joy of his forgiveness. And of course, 52, I mean 51, uh, where David was praying for God to uh, forgive him of his sins. And uh, then tonight, then we looked last week at God can be trusted even in dark times, and we looked at Psalm 43, uh, 42 and 43. And tonight we pick up with the goodness of God as seen through His justice and mercy. The goodness of God as seen through His justice and mercy. And we'll be looking at Psalm 73 through 83, but we'll not be looking at all of those Psalms, but uh, examples from those in Psalm 73 in particular will be uh, noted. Now when you think about uh, the either or, how we categorize things in life, we, what I'm meaning by either or, polar opposites such as uh, either dark or the opposite of dark is light, light all right? And uh, another would be uh, Cold would be either cold or hot, hot. either dead or Loud. alive. These are polar opposites of each other. We sort of categorize life that way. We have our boxes that we, we expect things to go into comfortably. 
And when it doesn't fit in either of our boxes, uh, we get disturbed by it. And that's exactly what happens when we consider the subjects of justice and mercy. And the psalmist was having difficulty with that as well as he, uh, as we look at the 73rd Psalm. Let me read to you uh, a portion of that. He said, uh, and, and I'll get to where these are in just a minute, but uh, he said, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are two pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. These are descriptions he's giving of people that he's looking at who are prospering but who are living wicked lives. And that just doesn't make sense to him uh, that, that God would, would do this. Uh, you know, we believe that it's either got to be justice or mercy. Justice is uh, somebody does something wrong, zap. Bolt of lightning hits them, strikes them dead, or gets their attention so that they do something about it. And mercy is that God doesn't do anything but forgive them and gives them a new opportunity. We expect it to be either justice or mercy. When people get what they deserve is justice, and mercy is when people don't get what they deserve. Should we turn the boxes? Hmm? Not at this point. Not okay. I'll get there. I'll get there. Uh, that perception causes them to misunderstand God's nature of being both just and merciful. The truth is that God doesn't fit into our boxes. His goodness can be seen in his justice and mercy. It's not an either or situation with God. It's not either justice or mercy. Again, we, we like to categorize things. Now, this section of the Psalms comes out of book three of Psalms. We told you that Psalms are divided into five books corresponding to, many believe, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. And this is book three. <clears throat> it contains Psalm 73 through 89. And it's a Psalm of Asaph. Asaph was, uh, the. you see that under Psalm 73, and, and the title is The Tragedy of the Wicked and the Blessed of Trust uh, and Blessedness of Trust in God, a Psalm of Asaph. Asaph was the lead music director, I guess would be a good word to use for him, of the, in the temple. He, they were of the... Uh, the, the tribe of Levi, they, they were part of those who would be the priestly tribe, but you had a group of them that were the singers. As if, you know, there wasn't, as if there were not enough duties for the number who were priests to take care of, some of them had to be singers too. And, and Asaph was the lead singer and the director of the singers uh, as well. Uh, it's a, this, it opens, it has 11 psalms attributed to the name of Asaph, 73 through 83. And the biblical tradition recognizes Asaph as a Levitical musician. Uh, we have other places in the Bible that call him that, First Chronicles 15 and chapter 16 and Ezra 3, uh, from the time of David. Uh, and, and it includes prayers from a later date some uh, examples of 74, 79, and 83, again attributed to Asaph, but we believe those are probably descendants of Asaph, part of his family. Uh, but it still went by the Psalms of Asaph. 
composed mainly of individual and community prayers that express the greater concerns faced by the community. A common and dominant theme holding this collection together is the crisis that require God's urgent and immediate intervention. A unique feature of this collection is that in several of the Psalms, God's voice is heard directly. And we're looking at uh, four in particular, uh, 73 that we're looking at right now, and then we'll look at 75, 78, and 81 uh, to highlight uh, the way God and, and the psalmist interacted in these crisis moments. But uh, it, you, you have some of that on item seven, one side of that sheet that you have. I didn't get one of those. Beth, I forgot to bring that primary sheet over. Yes, the Psalms of Asaph. You see that? Some of that that I was just giving you came from this side uh, of that item seven that you have there. Well, but I wanted to call your attention. That's what you have. You can study it even more closely uh, as as you have time, but I wanted you to, to have that as well. Uh, the Psalms are an invitation to be honest with God. You see, in all of these Psalms, he's just opening his heart. He's pouring out how he feels about things. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever felt that way in your relationship with God, that there are sometimes you just want to just tell him how you feel. <laughs> And, and, and then say, God, if, I, if I've done wrong in any way by saying these things to you, I, I hope you'll forgive me of it, but I, I, this is the way I feel about it. That's how the psalmist is coming across with these particular uh, psalms. And uh, you find that uh, he's angry with God because he sees the, the people who are not even serving God prospering. And, and those who love the Lord don't seem to be getting ahead. He, in fact, he, that's how he sees himself. Uh, and, and I don't know if there's ever been a time like that in your life, but uh, possibly it has been when you were angry with God or at least impatient and felt that uh, justice wasn't being served like you thought it should that somebody was doing wrong and, and it was affecting you and you just wish God would do something about it and it just isn't, didn't seem like he was acting fast enough. I've had people tell me in the past, in fact, on several occasions through my ministry, I've had people say, you know, I, I got mad with God and I told God off one man to me and he said, and I'm sorry for it. Do you think God will forgive me? And I said, yes, he will. He does. He forgives us. He listens. You see, there are times when he knows how we're feeling, but then he wants us to understand his viewpoint of it, too. He sees it different from us. It's not either or. It's not that those who deserve to get zapped, get zapped. And, and you know, it's not either or. It's not you know, as we wish they would get what they deserve, what we feel like they deserve. That's justice. We don't want them to get what they don't deserve, which is mercy. We want the mercy. <laughs> we want them to get justice. And that's where it does break down when you begin to think about it. Again, it's, we're the ones who are wanting them to get justice and us to get mercy when really, if we got what we justly deserved, what would we get from God? We don't deserve his dying on the cross to make payment for our sins. We don't, we don't deserve his forgiveness. If we got what we deserved, we'd all be zapped, you know? So it, it comes back to it's not how we look at things, it's how God is looking at things that makes the difference. And the psalmist is pouring out his heart to God of how he feels about this. 
But as you look at the first verse, he said, Truly God, you, uh, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. When you see this, the opposite negative truths that apply here, let me read to you. Uh, did God really respond to Israel's sin like they deserved? No. If he had, he would have done what Moses told him on a couple of days. Lord, why don't you just zap these people? Kill them all. There were times when God wanted to do that, and Moses said, God, but for your name's sake, don't do this. And there were some times when there were some of them who were put to death. And then the hand of God stayed. I mean, stopped so that more didn't die. In their rebellion, you remember on one occasion, snakes came and bit people and, and they were dying. And he told Moses to put a serpent on a staff and hold it up before the people and, those, and command those to, to people to look to that. And those who looked lived and those who didn't died. It was up to them whether or not they would live or die. But on several occasions, uh, you know, God, it, for, because of their rebellion, took the lives of many of them as an example to all of them of what they really deserved. But our misunderstanding of God's nature of justice can raise a lot of questions. Uh, on page 51 of the pupil book if you've got one of those he said I've got some questions read the following passages and record questions the psalmist asked in your own words look at verse 13 of 73 here was a question he asked surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence what's he saying there cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. Did I really do the right thing in trusting you as the Savior and Lord of my life? <laughs> if I hadn't done that, I could be doing what all these other people are doing and they're getting by with it. Why couldn't I be doing that and getting by with it too? You've never thought that, I know. But Psalmist did. He, he said, did I really come to you for cleansing was it, was it really right or, or since they're not getting what they deserve, then maybe I should be involved in what they're doing and get by with it too. They're living crooked lives and they're getting ahead. I'm trying to do what's right and I can't even get ahead. That's how he's, what he's doing in questioning God. Look at Psalm 74 verse 1. Oh God, why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? What's this question here? A plea for relief is what he's doing here, isn't it? Why have you cast us off forever? Here he's saying that God's turned his back on them and he, he, he wants God to hear him. Quite a different story there. And then verses 10 and 11 of 74 says, Oh God, how long will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? Take it out of your bosom and destroy them, for God is my king from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. 10 and 11, that's it. I went on through 12. Then look at verses, at chapter, Psalm 77, 7 through 9. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? And then the word Selah. We'll get to that in a minute too. And I said, this is my anguish. 
but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. You see a change after <clears throat> Selah was the end of a verse in their music. It also means pause and think on these things. It's something to stop and meditate about, to think about, to ponder. And then Psalm 79, 5 also says to us, 79, 5, How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? There was a, it, it's a prayer for, uh, for Israel uh, who has been destroyed by the enemies. God has brought justice upon them. He, he brought judgment and, uh, for their sin, and he's wondering how long will this continue? You see in, in these questions that he's asking that, uh, that we've probably asked the same thing from time to time. Lord, how long is this going to last? Or at other times, Lord, when will we see justice come about? common for people to feel the same way that the psalmist felt in that day. Let me share with you. It said, we do our best and wonder why God does not bless us. We see others who have no time for God enjoying a hedonistic lifestyle, living a life of wealth and luxury while seemingly immune to hardship. Like the psalmist, we envy worldly entertainers and corrupt politicians and their popularity and success. We suddenly began to wonder, does God have a different standard for justice? Rather than manipulating society like a puppeteer, constantly blessing the righteous and punishing the sinner, does he in his justice allow the consequences of life's choices to play out in a just result? How does God do it? Well, look at verses 2 through 5 of Psalm 73. Verses 2 through 5. Go back to Psalm 73 where he says, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. What happens when we try to answer all our questions about God's justice with a limited understanding of divine justice? We come up with wrong answers, don't we? There are times when we try to answer for God, but we're not God and we don't see things the way God sees it. Look at Psalm 73, 16 through 19. He said, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. You see what happens here? Where does the difference come in his life? Where does the difference come in how he's viewing it? When he goes into the sanctuary of the Lord, doesn't it? He said, when I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. And, there was, and, and keep in mind, for them, the sanctuary was God's dwelling place. And he's meaning when he came into the presence of God, he began to see things as, as God saw it. He, he said, I, I see that they're not really in the place where I, I'm thinking they are. Their feet are on slippery slopes. The end is just not now. Their end is coming. They, they're going to get what they deserve. In other words, God is slow in in his justice many times to give people an opportunity to change their ways. But if they don't, they've set their feet on a path that's going to lead to destruction. 
And sometimes that path will not end in true justice until the end of their life. There are other times when it comes before that. How many times have we seen the, the powerful, the ones that are rolling in money and look like they're having the time of their life come to an end? Who are some that, who's that guy that was trafficking women? Epstein. Huh? Epstein. 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 And what did he do to get out of it? Killed himself? Some, there's some question by some that whether somebody else killed him because he might be going to squeal on some other people that were involved. And we're beginning to hear things coming out now of how many other people of high authority in life in other countries even might have been caught up in some of this that he was involved in. We don't know yet the full extent of it all. Even involving some from England and other places and some of our past start officials, <laughs> even presidents, politicians. politicians. In other words, it may look like the high rollers and the fun times of life, but guess what? If they don't change, God has a way. Well, what did the psalmist say here? When I came into your presence, I really began to see what it's all about. Then I understood their end. What was their end? Surely you set them in slippery places, cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They're consumed with terror. You see, there's coming a day. It may not be when you and I want it to be, but it's coming. That those who are not doing what God would have them to do. But wait a minute. Doesn't that also come back to us? That we need to be careful about our own lives, don't we? That sometimes we get to looking at other people and what they're doing and we forget that we're not always as obedient as we should be. Because you see, sin is not just in the things we do that we shouldn't do, it's also in the things we're not doing that we ought to be doing. And God's going to hold us accountable for that as well. What does it say about the blood of people being upon our hands? If we fail to witness to folks, God's going to hold us accountable when we had an opportunity to share the good news with someone and we didn't and they missed heaven. We're going to be held responsible. So often we're thinking about the bad things that people are doing that we wish we could see justice happen. I wish they'd get what they deserve, especially if it involves you and how somebody might be doing things that are bringing harm to you or, or bad things to you, and you wish it could somehow get turned around on them. But in the process of doing that, we need to look at our own lives. Are we doing all that God wants us to be doing? You see, God in his mercy and justice doesn't allow his people to get away with indulging in the world's sinful pleasures like the wicked do because he knows that uh, it's going to destroy us. When he allows us to suffer consequences, he's being just and merciful toward us. You see, there are some times when God doesn't bring about the judgment he simply backs off and allows what we're doing to bring on its own consequences. And that's judgment, isn't it? You see, there are times when we've got a hedge about us that if God simply removes that and allows us in the things that we're doing to continue in that, the end result is going to come and God's just simply standing back saying, well, you, you started on this path you're going to have to deal with the consequences of that. I'm not going to be able to protect you like I was. So sometimes that's the justice of God. As the psalmist said, their feet are on a slippery slope. It, it's going to come. So not always does God bring that justice. There are times when God simply backs off and allows the justice to work itself out because of what's going to happen as a result. Justice 
Delayed is justice denied, some people say. But if we put justice in, if we say that, we're putting justice in the either or category, aren't we? Justice delayed is justice denied. Is it really? We use that phrase, but is it really? We're saying it's either or. We have a tendency to tell God how he should exact his justice and we want him to do it now. And that's what the, the psalmist was doing in these psalms that we've got before us this, this evening. 73 through, what was it there? 84. All of these are psalms that are dealing with that same subject matter. 70. Uh, 4, 79, 83, or just, we, we see some excerpts of that. In fact, somebody read 7411 for us. 7411. What do you hold back your hand, your right hand, take it from the folds of your garment and destroy them? Somebody else read 79, 6. All right, and then 83, 13, 14, and 15. Psalm 83, 13, 14, 15. Make them like tumbleweeds, of my God, like the shaft before the wind, as, if, as fire consumes the forest, or a flame sets the mountains ablaze. Am I reading the right thing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so uh, pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. All right. Here, the psalmist in all of these, you've got examples of it in these. I said it's in all of them, really, but he's expressing a wish or command, isn't he? He's, he's wanting God to do what he's stating. He's expressing a wish or a command. These are called precatory psalms. Uh, and since Jesus came to fulfill and not discard all of the Old Testament, we come to that point today that we've many times feel the same way, that we need to, we want to express a, a wish or a command of God. How are we to understand or apply these? I think, first of all, we must take them in their specific context and understand what they meant then before trying to apply them now. As you look at these psalms and you feel the same way that they did in expressing a wish or a command of God, see what it's talking about then. He's, he's talking about the, the people of God, except when you get to uh, uh, 86, and that's David's psalm there. David's doing it. Uh, the others are, are psalms of Asaph, but the 86 is that of, of David. And, and then we've also got to understand that they are poetry and therefore expressed extravagantly and dramatically. Now, this, this is, when, when, it, when the psalmist is writing it this way, it's probably more dramatic than what it might be as we would put it into words. And it's important to realize the curses are not over trivial matters. Uh, those that are being cursed are mocking and dishonoring God by harming his people. And that's why they are expressing some very strong words in some of these psalms. And then these psalms also don't seek personal vengeance. They're asking that God vindicate himself so that he gets the glory that he rightly deserves. So that's, when you're looking at these psalms, concerning justice and mercy, and you see the strong request and the accusations being placed, know that it wasn't for personal matters, but it was for the name of God that was being put down by those. In other words, it looks like they're trampling on God by the way their lifestyle is and, and not acknowledging God. And the psalmist is trying to take a stand for God, not necessarily just a personal uh, matter. We need to recognize how Jesus fulfills and transforms the Psalms. In his mercy, he chose to take our shame on himself in order that we could come to know him. 
It could be that God's justice seems delayed because we're the ones who, uh, who should be working for that justice. We, you know, we have an opportunity. Even as we're, we're looking at the uh, subject of abortion today, and I appreciate those who went and uh, represented our church today. I think there were 10 of you who were able to go and, and uh, you know, as we think of that, that's, that's justice delayed. We think, how come the halls of Congress and the legislatures in many states can just say, hey, this is okay? It, it you know, it bothered me on 9-11 when those deaths came and all of the people of Congress came out on the steps of, of uh, Washington, the Capitol, they came out and, and uh, in unity, uh, you know, declaring their allegiance to God and, and, and how we take a stand, and yet they went right back in talking about subjects like abortion. You know, it, didn't, it doesn't make sense. Here, these were taking lives, but we can take lives, and it's a different thing. You know, how, how do you reconcile that? Those are the things that we see in our day. Uh, but it should be that God's justice seems delayed. It, or it could be that God's justice seems delayed because we're the ones who need to be working for that justice, as I said. He's giving us an opportunity to make stands for that which is right and to help right the wrongs. And it seems like the harder we work on some of these issues the more difficult it, it gets. But on that one subject of abortion, it may be that this year, as no other in the last 48 years, we have a, we're coming closer to seeing a reversal of Roe versus Wade than at any time since it was passed by the Supreme Court. I don't think they're going to completely do away with Roe v. Wade. Personally, I think it's going to send it back to the states, and the states are going to, uh, many of them have already said, if, it, if, it's, if it's overturned and then the states can declare what they want, the states have already said, we're not going to have it in our state, Louisiana being one of those. And again, we know that not everybody who has a child wants that child, but there are a lot of people who would love to have a child that if they would put them up for adoption, somebody would adopt that child. You know, we understand there are some who get pregnant who can't take care of these children. But rather than abort them, why not allow somebody who would give them love and care to uh, be able to have them? In fact, many of our country who are wanting to adopt children are going out of the country to get children because of the lack of, the lack of children in our land to, to be adopted. And uh, so, you know, there, there are ways of, of helping with these matters, making things uh, different. Well, when God is silent in the context of suffering and injustice, it doesn't contradict his goodness, but reminds us his ways are not our ways. It also reminds us that his timing is not our timing. Uh, and we can be thankful that God in his wisdom knows the time and how to, to do things. We've all received God's mercy, though, because of his delayed justice. I mean, he, look how merciful he was in giving us the opportunity to come to a point of trusting him as Savior and Lord of our life. He gave us that chance so that we could be forgiven and have a new life in Him. Had He zapped us the moment we deserved it, we wouldn't have had that chance to come on to the point where we made that commitment to Him. So, you know, many times He's doing something we cannot see when it looks like He's delaying to us. Part of that may be to give opportunity for somebody to come to know Him. Think about Paul. We talk about terrorists today. Paul was one of the greatest terrorists of all times. He was literally going about arresting. He had uh, soldiers who went with him under the authority of the law 
who were going to uh, city by city, going and arresting Christians and having them persecuted, put to death. I mean, to hear that Paul was headed your way was, was the word to get, to get in hiding. You didn't want to be out where he knew where you were. And many wonder why in the world didn't God strike him down before he got to the, the, on the road to Damascus? Why didn't it happen before that? I can't understand why, but I know that God in his timing was doing things as he sees it. And he got Paul's attention. And Paul made a total turnaround. That's why he said, look, you talk about sinners, I'm the chief of sinners. I thought I was doing good. I thought I was doing a good thing for God. But I came to realize that that was wrong. And I think that's why, you know, he went through so much himself then as a follower of Jesus, as a missionary going from place to place, being thrown in prison, being shipwrecked, being stoned and left for dead outside a city wall, and yet he kept going Why he knew what it meant. He had been on the other side of the story. He was wanting to make sure as many people as, as he could would follow Jesus because he knew the importance of following Jesus, not just doing things because you thought it was right. But we've all received God's mercy. The psalmist's honest wrestling with God led him to the truth about God's justice and mercy, that they are not contradictory. They are not either or. Can we believe that God's justice and mercy can go hand in hand? That his mercy allows us the opportunity to change, but if we don't, his justice is sure. He is a merciful God. But just because he's merciful doesn't mean that what we've done, we're going to get by with it, does it? That's why it's important that we seek his forgiveness. Because it, he will give us an opportunity to change our ways and to come to him. But if we don't, we're going to pay a price for it, aren't we? Even as Christians, we can pay a price, can't we? We can lose some of the, the, the rewards that we would receive. The Bible talks about carnal Christians. Christian, people that are truly saved, but they're not living for Jesus the way they should. They're going to be saved yet so as by fire, it says in Thessalonians. They're going to get there. But there's going to be a lot. Well, we used to say you're going to get there by the skin of your teeth. That means you're just going to get in. And that's going to be a joy in itself. But I think there's going to be a little bit of sadness on the part of, look what I could have had. Look at what, look at what could have been mine had I been faithful to him. Had I served him as he wanted me to. It's not just a matter of getting to heaven. We should want to be pleasing to the Lord. And when the psalmist came into the sanctuary, that's when he began to see things differently. Why? He sensed the presence of God and he began to understand things in a different light. Now keep in mind, again, I share with you, the sanctuary was the dwelling place of God. God's sanctuary today is the, the earth. The Bible even says that, that the earth is his footstool. It's, it's his creation. That's his sanctuary. He's he resides in our heart and life. We're his sanctuary. That's why it's important we take care of our bodies. Because this body is the temple of the Lord. And his temple, and I shared that with you recently, Frank and Ernest, where he told him, I know your body is the temple of the Lord, but you've got a congregation. You know? Our body is the temple of the Lord, but we need to take care of it because it belongs to him. And, and wherever we are, he is. 
And I think sometimes because of that, we lose the sense of the presence of God. You see, when they went to the temple to be in the sanctuary, to be in his presence, it was a time of being still and knowing that he was God. And for us, so often, because he is everywhere, we fail to stop and think on these things as the word Selah means. We fail to stop and realize that when you look at the sunset in all of its beauty, or the sunrise in its beauty, or other things about you that God's here, He's with us, and He wants us to know, I'm here for you. I, I think He wants to come to us in so many ways that many times we overlook. When we remember and reflect on the goodness of God and the goodness that He has shown to us through Jesus, I think we can make the same determination as the psalmist in verses 23 through 25 of 73. Look at that. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. When he came into the presence of God, he realized, God, you're always with me. That's worth more than anything else. You're holding me by my right hand. You're guiding me with your counsel. And afterward, you're gonna receive me into your glory. Why am I worried about these other things here on earth? Why am I worried about God bringing justice to these folks? My greatest joy should be that he's with me, holding me by the hand. One day he's going to take me on into glory with him, and until that day he's with me every step of the way. And I could begin to focus not on them, but on me. And the relationship I have with God, it truly helps me see things in a different light. Most of us have struggled with the same things that the psalmist struggled with here. The prosperity of the wicked and the suffering of the righteous. We've yearned for a more immediate re rectification of the situation. We want bad people to suffer and good people to prosper. We want fairness. Waiting on the Lord has many applications. We've got to look for Him in every circumstance of life. We must be willing to trust His righteous judgment. We must be willing to persevere in the circumstances of the moment. God will prevail. God will vindicate. God will reign. And that's more important than anything else that we are in his presence. With him holding our hand and one day even ushering us on into his presence. Doesn't matter what happens here. That's going to be worth more than anything else that the world could ever offer. Because he even, Jesus even said, what have you accomplished if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? They may be looking like they've got much here. They may have the most of anybody else in the world, but if they don't have Jesus, what is it? It's nothing. Lord, thank you that we can come into your presence and know you're with us. And Father, this is our prayer. That rather than focus on what others seem to be doing and not getting what they deserve as we see it, I pray that we'll leave it in your hands knowing that you know how to handle things better than we do. The psalmist tried to make requests and commands of you of how you should handle it, but Lord... We've been guilty of the same thing at times. I pray that we'll just simply be mindful of our relationship with you. 
and let you take care of the other, knowing that in the end, it's all going to work out as it should. And more important than anything else is that we're right with you, and one day we'll be able to spend eternity with you. May that be the goal of our life, is to so live our lives daily as to be pleasing to you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. We're going to take a break. The food's been prepared. Any instructions? I guess you know what to do. <laughs> Help yourself. We'll begin again in just a little bit.